Stark's main line of attack would be at the bridge. He ordered two detachments to flank bomb. Colonel Samuel Herrick of Vermont and his famous rangers were to come in from the south. Colonel Moses Nichols, commanding the New Hampshire militia, positioned his men to come in from the north. Units of the New Hampshire and Berkshire militia would attack a Tory redoubt, a fortification to Stark's left flank just before the bridge. Baum had placed a unit of English marksmen, all his Canadian rangers, half his Brunswick grenadiers, and a cannon on the road leading to the bridge over the Wallum sack. On top of the hill and quite a distance from the bridge, Baum placed all his dragoons and more English grenadier marksmen. About 100 of his Indians were camped just north of the hill. The other half of his Brunswick grenadiers about 200 yards down the road to the west. Special troops guarded the area between the bridge position and the hilltop. Part of Stark's plan was for Colonel Herrick to sneak up on the Dragoon emplacement and open fire. That was the signal for all the American forces to join in the battle with a uniform attack on the Tory redoubt and Stark's main attack on the bridge position. In order for Herrick and his rangers to cross the river and come up from the south, they had to cross open field and would surely be noticed by bomb, who was positioned with the dragoons on the hill. Herrick and Stark worked out a plan where Herrick's 200 men would move in small groups across open ground. They hoped to surprise the enemy, giving them the impression they were disgruntled rebel militia returning to their homes, or better yet, loyalists coming to join the forces of the king. The plan worked. Tory advisors assured Baum that the civilian-clad musket men were local loyalists coming to join the expedition. Herrick's rangers crossed the river and started positioning themselves for battle near the Dragoon fortification. The Abenaki Indians and a small band of Mohawks became aware of what was happening and realized Baum was going to be trapped. Many of them quietly slipped away, even before the first shot was fired. The American force was waiting for that first volley from Herrick's rangers to signal the opening of battle. As it turned out, that signal came from a most unexpected source. About three o'clock, Parson Thomas Allen, a minister with the Berkshire militia from the Pittsfield area, crawled up near the Tory redoubt to lecture and preach to the loyalists on their misguided patriotism. They mean only harm. Come out. I demand an immediate and a total surrender now. Over yonder. Over yonder is the enemies of our country, of our free land. Think of what you're doing. Allen was unarmed, but not for long. He immediately got a musket and fired back. He became a folk hero after that and fought as a soldier in the battle. What he didn't know at the time was, he gave the signal that started the Battle of Bennington. Herrick and Nichols opened fire on the Dragoon Redoubt. Colonel David Hobart with New Hampshire and Berkshire militia and Colonel Thomas Stickney with part of a New Hampshire unit attacked the Tory Redoubt. Seeing the Americans coming at them, the Tories became frightened and all fired at once. It was a fatal mistake. A musket took 30 seconds or more to reload. They suffered severe losses, but fought back as best they could. Flintlock musket was the basic weapon of the Americans, British, and the Germans. Commanders on both sides planned their tactics around its capabilities. 
A smooth bore rifle firing a loose-fitting ball. It was not accurate. A trained soldier could hit his target at 80 to 100 yards. He could load and fire three or four times a minute, that is, if he didn't stop to aim too closely. In order to get the most effective use of the rifleman's fire, lines were formed, usually in a standing or kneeling position. One line fired while the other reloaded and then fired, while the other reloaded and repeated the same action. Many of the Americans used the musket firing long rifle, a more effective, more accurate weapon, but it lacked a bayonet, and in battle, the rifleman needed that added weapon. In the hands of a good shot, the long rifle could hit targets at astonishing ranges. The Americans used it most effectively, striking officers and harassing troops who thought themselves safe. Sticky broke off of his unit and headed for the bridge, joining General Stark, who had launched an attack simultaneously with the attack on the Tory Redoubt. Stark took his force down the center of the road leading to the bridge, while sending others to cross the shallow Wollumsack to the right and left of his position. The Canadians broke from their position at the bridge and ran. It must be remembered the Americans were citizen soldiers, fierce fighters, but not the best disciplined. Their shouts and cheers were sometimes as frightening as their loud cracking muskets. On the other side of the bridge, about 100 feet from the crossing, the English and Brunswick Grenadiers abandoned a valuable cannon and ran west. Herrick and his rangers, along with Nichols and the New Hampshire men, had the Dragoon Redoubt at the top of the hill under fire. Baum with his Dragoons were well fortified behind log barricades. The Americans moved cautiously and slowly. bullet or a sharpshooter found his mark. An ammunition wagon inside the enemy fortification exploded. taken to a house just east of the battlefield where he died a day later. It was almost five o'clock when the last of the prisoners were rounded up. There was a lot of confusion and disorder after the battle. Some Americans were marching about with small groups of prisoners. Others were drinking rum Stark had provided, or enjoying some medicinal wine Parson Allen had captured from the Germans. Some of the men were enjoying the spoils of war promised by General Stark. Clothing, guns, swords, boots, and shoes. Many of the men were just lying around on the ground, exhausted. Huzzah! 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 